Good morning. Well, I just want to stop to thank you guys so much for praying for my little girl this week. Um, she had, if you didn't know, she had surgery on both of her thumbs, which is pretty big deal when you're four years old. And, um, and everything went great, and um, she's recovering well, and everything went good. Uh, funny thing happened when we were in the hospital. I have to share with you that... Um, so, you know, they ask you a lot of questions before surgery and then another person comes in and asks more questions and then another person comes in and asks more questions. And as part of that, um, one of the things that they asked, uh, Megan, my wife was, um, so, so where, where was Cora born? And Cora really loud, just very confidently said, I was born in a manger. And we were like, okay. <laughs> and the doctor was like, okay, well, that's, all right. And, uh. She loves the song Away in a Manger. We just had Christmas, you know, and she's been singing it a lot. So apparently she feels like she was born in a manger also. And uh, so anyways, a couple of days go by. Um, and, and yesterday I just kind of th thought it'd be funny. So I'm like, so Cora, you were born in a manger? She's like, yeah. I was like, oh, cool. So anyways, we're going to have to have a conversation and a follow up on that later that she was actually not born in a manger. But um, yeah, it's kind of funny. Well, last weekend began our study in Romans, and um, I'm just excited to, to cover this book. We're going to walk through the whole book uh, over, over the next few weeks, and we kind of said last week, um, from last week till, till Easter, we're going to be in this book. So um, there's a lot here. It's heavy, um, but it's so good. And uh, if you missed last weekend, if you missed uh, the message, I would encourage you to get on our website um, or go to YouTube and watch it, listen to it um, while you're on the treadmill this week or whatever, and get caught up. It's an important passage because it kind of sets the tone for this whole um, this whole book. And it was his greeting, but it also really kind of tells where the book is going. So if you missed it, um, catch up. It would be good to catch up. Um, and so if you didn't make it last week, in a couple sentences, I want to tell you what happened. So chapter one, Paul was the author, and he declared that everybody needs Jesus, and that we're all sinful, all of us, and that the gospel is for everyone. That's the good news. And um, Paul goes on to say that he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And, and that was very true for Paul, and um, he's just not ashamed. Such a bold statement. And then towards the end of chapter one, we saw that um, when you get God wrong, you get humanity wrong. And, and we talked about the implications of when we don't understand God and we don't understand the gospel, um, it really affects us as humans. And, and so um, Paul really encouraged uh, his readers at the end of last week uh, to, that, that we all have to place our faith in, in Christ. And so, guys, we place our faith in stuff all the time. Right now, you're, you're placing your faith in the chair that you're sitting in. Um, as we drive around, uh, you know, I, I live out on Carrier, and I pass people going 65, and they're about two feet away from me going the other way all day, every day. I don't even think about it. I have more faith in those drivers that I don't even know, sometimes more than I do in God and His provision for me and his, the way that He wants to lead me. Um, we, we put our faith in a lot of stuff all the time. We just don't maybe realize that's what we're doing. But Paul really encouraged us last week um, to place our faith in Christ, um, because he can be trusted. Uh, this week, we're going to be in chapters 2 and 3, and you're like, wait a minute, how are we going to pull that off since last week was one chapter and it took the whole day? Well, we are going to do a little bit of a summary as we go today, so we won't hit every single verse, but um, I pledge to you that I, we will hit the high points. We will, we will talk about this. So with that, I want to encourage you this week to go back and read chapters 2 and 3. And if you're like me and you want to know where we're going, next week we will be just in chapter 4. So if you want to read ahead this week, go for it. Um, you can read chapters 2 through 4 and, and, and really be ready for next week. We're going to be talking about Abraham and his, his faith, his example of faith. It's all about heart transformation, not behavior modification. It's all about heart transformation not behavior modification. Let me explain. Many times as humans, this is where we get it wrong. We try to behave our, our way into a right relationship with God. 
And so we, it's, it's by doing. And so we go to church. We maybe even love people, serve, give. And so this is a works-based religion. And um, tr- we're really trying to earn God's favor. We're trying to make everything good with God by doing. And so, so I just call that behavior modification. Like, uh, and then very different from that is surrender. And so surrender not only in salvation, like the, the moment that we begin following Jesus with our life, have our sins forgiven, but surrender every single day. Starting the day going, God, I'm yours. I don't know how to do my life, but you can lead me. Uh, one of my, and really, really what that, that means is uh, being has to come before doing. And many times we get this flipped, so, so easily get this flipped. And um, on our own, we can do the behavior modification thing. We can change what we're doing, but only in surrender, only God can actually change our heart. We, I can't change my own heart. God is the only one that can do that. One of my favorite postures um, kind of in worship uh, is, is just to have open hands. And, and for me, what I'm saying when I stand before God and, and I'm, I'm singing to him, open hands to me just means uh, I surrender, you know? And it's vulnerable. Uh, I mean, when I was in high school and I got in a fight, I put my hands up, right? I didn't come to a fight with my hands open. That'd be stupid. I put my hands up. Well, it is vulnerable to come before God in this position. But this is what God desires for us. Every day that we come to him with open hands in a posture of surrender, and we say, God, I need you. Lead me. We have to be with God and before God before we can do anything. We have to surrender to him first before we do. Otherwise, our doing um, is self-focused. Our doing is us trying to earn something from God. Um, This is really the difference between being religious and having a relationship with God. So last week, Paul talked to all of his audience, uh, which was the Jews, which is God's chosen people, and the Gentiles, which represents everyone else. And we, we kind of ended with this super rough list. I don't know if you remember the list, but it was this rough list of sins that unrighteous people commit. And I think most of us looked at that and went, whoa, dang, that is like, that, that must be rough to be unrighteous. And, um, and last week we talked a lot about unrighteous uh, and righteous. And righteousness just means that we have right standing with God. Unrighteousness meaning we don't. We don't we're not good with God. And, and so what Paul's going to do today, what we'll see, is he's going to correct our assumption. Our assumption that, um, but hey, I'm, I'm doing good. Isn't, isn't that good enough? Isn't that good enough to be good with God if I'm doing good things? Paul's going to correct that today. And, and so I, I like to know where we're going, so maybe you want to know. Maybe you want to write this down. Chapter 2, really what we're going to see is that rescue won't happen by trying harder or following religious laws. Many people feel this way. Hey, if I just, if I just go to church, if I just do the right things, that, that gets me right with God. Um, but guys, we can't rescue ourselves. We'll see that in this first chapter. chapter uh, that's chapter two. The second chapter that we will study today and kind of overview is uh, really says that God's righteousness has rescued the world through Jesus' death and resurrection. So we can't rescue ourselves, we'll see in chapter 2. Chapter 3 is that God is our rescue. God is our rescue. So like I said a minute ago, today we're going to hit kind of the main points here, and so um, there will be some verses that that I go over and that I skip over. And um, I do want you to, to, this week, Go word for word, read all this, but for now, take really good notes 
pay attention so you have a good understanding of this, and then I would love for you to go back through it this week. Uh, many people in our church uh, will study things deeper later and, and kind of go into it, and, and there's many small groups within our church that um, they do what's called sermon-based small groups. So later in the week, they kind of talk about it together with each other. And so what I did today is before each kind of major section of text, um, I kind of put a title to it. And so that way we know, okay, this section is about this. And so that's why I'm doing that. And so the first section here in chapter two uh, really is that we're all, uh, that all are guilty. Okay. And that's going to be uh, the first four verses. All are guilty. Uh, follow with me this morning in chapter two, verse one, it says, therefore you have no excuses. O man, every one of you who judges for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge practice the very same things. It's stupid to judge others because their sin looks different than ours. It's stupid. And I put my name on there kind of as a joke. You can quote me on that. But really, it is stupid for us to judge others ever just because our sin looks different than theirs. Let's go down to verse 4. It, it says, uh, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. You guys, the kindness of God is not a license to sin. The kindness of God is not a license to sin. Well, God will forgive me. Who really, I mean, it's not that big a deal. God will forgive me. We uh, sang a song. I don't remember when it was. At one point we sang this song uh, from we the Kingdom, it's a song called Holy Water, maybe you've heard it, and the lyric says, I don't want to abuse your grace. Have you guys heard that song, some of you? Um, that's what this song is talking about. That's what this song is talking about. God's kindness towards us should lead us to repentance, not sin. The next section here, uh, verses 5 through 10, will be covered in this, Condemned by our works condemned by our works. Verse 5 says this, But because of your hard and impotent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. God wants us to have a soft heart towards other people. Um, God wants us to have a soft heart, not a hard heart. Paul is talking to the person who passes judgment on other people. And what Paul is saying is, it is not our duty to judge other people. God is a good judge. He can do that himself. He doesn't need help. He's a fair judge. Justice will be served with God. It's just not our place. Uh, verses 6 through 10 kind of describes uh, those that know God, and, and it refers back to what we talked about last week, which is the righteous people that are in right standing with God and the unrighteous people that are not in good standing with God. And um, really, it talks about how our good works can't save us. Our good works are not going to save us. The next section here, um, equal treatment under the law. Well, let me read verse 12. It says, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So no matter who you are, if you sin, you will be condemned. That would be terrible news if the gospel wasn't true. And because no one is perfect, you guys. Um, we are born with the sinful nature I use this example a lot, but like, if you have a two-year-old, you know, because you don't have to teach them to slap you in the face and say no. They just do it. Because, like, we're literally born with a sinful nature, and we, we all are born unrighteous. And so, basically, what, what Paul was trying to say here is that the Jews um, weren't perfect. He's like, you guys aren't perfect. And whether you follow the law, the religious laws or not, uh, you're not perfect. And so what we find there is that the, the law can't save us. It's not going to work. That's not what gives us salvation. The law is not going to save us, whether you follow it or not. 
Next section here, which I will read all this, is uh, verses 17 through 24. And I'll just say advantages of Jews. Um, what, what, what's going to happen here is Paul is going to begin to address some arguments that the Jews might have. And so follow with me verses 17 through 24. It says, But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in the darkness, an instructor of foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself while you preach against stealing? Do you steal? You who say that the one must commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. And then it says, For it is written, The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Basically, if you think following the law just automatically means that you have a relationship with God, you're wrong. Um, you're blind. You're foolish. Um, Paul is saying a relationship with God is for Jews or Greeks. It's just because, and what he's saying here is, just because you you were basically a Sunday school teacher, you taught the law, you taught the religious things, that just because you taught it doesn't mean that you have a relationship with God. And, and it's the same for true for our church. Just because someone is a Sunday school teacher, that's not why they're a follower of God. First, they have to have a relationship with God. And so he's just kind of calling out those people that are kind of like, well, I'm a teacher of the law. Obviously, I know God. And he's kind of like, well, that's not necessarily true. Just like for me, I have no advantage in my relationship with God over you guys just because I'm standing up here teaching this. Um, I have the same access to God as you do, and I had to give my life to Christ just like you did. And that's kind of what he's, he's saying to these people. So verse 17 and 18 is really the question, and then verses 24 was the answer. Next section here, uh, I just want to call the true people of God. So who is that? I'll, I'll just tell you um, a little bit of a warning. Uh, You've got to be mature for this next section. I said that exact thing in the 9 o'clock, and there's this whole row of teenagers, and they all looked at each other. I was like, don't look at each other. Like, that makes it worse. Um, so, uh, circumcision is what's talked about here, and it was more of an example of works. It was more of, of an example of doing things for God. And so this is one example of doing things for God. So follow with me. Verse 25, it says, for circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So Paul will soon argue here um, that every, everyone has broken the law. And, and circumcision doesn't, in and of itself, doesn't rescue you or, or anyone from judgment. And so let's keep reading verse 26. It says, so if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have written the code. And circumcision will break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely outwardly, um, nor is circumcision outward and physical. <clears throat> but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So Paul is beginning an argument here um, against the traditional view of Judaism. And he is saying it's all about your heart. It's all about your heart. It's all about a relationship with God. In the next chapter, in chapter 3, which we're almost there, it will uh, really give some powerful arguments that the true people of God are the people that have surrendered their life to Him. That's who the true people of God are. And so, kind of to summarize in a sentence or so, Romans 2 is, is written to show these Jews that 
um, living by the law or circumcision um, does not make them righteous before God. That in and of itself does not make them righteous before God. And this probably came as a huge shock because some of these people are like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm doing the right things. Shouldn't that mean that I'm good with God? Um, I'm being religious. I'm, I'm checking the stuff off the list. And, um, but Paul's saying that a, a true Jew is one that has experienced circumcision in their heart uh, by the Spirit of God. And so let's continue in chapter 3. And, and really this whole chapter here is um, kind of has a big question. It kind of answers a big question of how do people become right with God? Uh, I think this is an important question that's relevant to us. How do people become right with God? Don't, I mean, do you want to be right with God? I definitely want to be right with God. So it's going to answer this question. So the first section here is, are there any advantages for these Jews? And, and so Paul's going to answer this kind of rhetorical question that he poses in, in um, verse 1. So I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. Follow with me. It says, Then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Um, what if someone were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. So what is Paul saying? He's, he's given this rhetorical question, are there any advantages for the Jews? And what Paul is saying is, um, you guys, the Jews, you, you, were, you had the word of God, or um, you had it because of the oracles of God. Like you um, knew the word of God, uh, but the downside to that is that you knew the word of God, so you're going to be held accountable to it. And so I don't, and he's kind of like saying that's maybe not an advantage. And, and really at the end of that, at the end of verse 4, he is, uh, the, the part that's in quotes, it is, uh, he is quoting from Psalm 51.4. And um, so David had, uh, basically had someone killed. Um, she, he had Bathsheba's husband killed. And then in Psalm 51, he's coming before God. And, and I'll read it. It says that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. He's saying, God, if you punish me, like, I get it. Like, I understand I deserve that. That's what David's saying, and, and he's quoting from that. Um, so the next section here is, is ready to sin ready to sin, or reason to sin, I meant to say. And this is actually really funny. Like this section, uh, verse 5 through 8, it's really funny because it's like the stupidest question ever. And, but he wants to go ahead and clear it up. It's important to him. And so let's, let's read this here and talk about it. Verse 5, it says, But if our, right, if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Listen to this. It says that God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us. I speak in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory. Why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why, do, uh, why not do evil that good may come? Like why we do bad stuff so, um, so good can come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. So what he's saying here is that people were actually saying, it's actually good if we sin, because that just gives God an opportunity to like give us grace and forgive us, so it makes God good. So we're just kind of, sin by sinning, we're just kind of showing people God is good. And he's like, that is stupid. He's basically saying, God's grace isn't a license to sin. God's grace isn't a license to sin. Now let's look at um, section 9, or verses 9 through 18, and um, I'm not going to talk about every single bit of it, but I just want to tell you what's happening here. Paul, Paul is quoting Scripture from Psalms and, and some other areas in Scripture, and Paul is basically saying we're all sinners. 
And he's like proven it with a whole bunch of scripture. And, and he's not only saying that we're all uh, sinners, he's kind of saying like we're evil. And he's saying that we're evil and it, and it mentions all these different body parts. So it's like in our, <clears throat> in our mind, in our mouth, in our throat, in our uh, tongue, lips, feet, eyes, all these different areas. He just wants to be like, like we're legit sinners. We are, we are actually sinners. And so um, I know that's really small. It was bigger on my computer, sorry. Uh, but there are some, some scriptures that, that he's quoting. Um, verses 10 is that first scripture, and then it kind of goes down from there. Um, but I think that's cool how he quoted scripture in his scripture. Um, and, but guys, our, our culture is very different. Our culture says, hey, man, man is basically good. Like many people would argue with us that, hey, man is basically good. Um, but what Paul is saying is, no, we're not. Like, on our own, we're, we're actually evil. We need God to rescue us. And um, something that I've, I've said in the past is that really the good in me is just God in me. Because on my own, I'm, I've, I'm pretty sinful. Uh, I, won't, I mean, when I am, am giving in to my flesh, I'm, I'm a pretty sinful guy. The next section here is, is the righteousness from God. And I, I do want to read this part um, and, uh, and start in verse 21. But uh, Paul introduces the good news. So like, that's heavy stuff. We're all sinners. That's not like awesome. But he does introduce the good news. And he starts right at the beginning by saying, but now. And, and he's making a contrast um, that we can't be made righteous by doing good works or doing the law or being religious. And, um, and since we're all sinners, there has to be another way for us to be made right with God. And so he's going to talk about that. There's got to be a way, besides religion, besides being religious, there's got to be a way for us to be in right standing with God. So let's read verse 21 through 26 here. It says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law uh, uh, and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. Hopefully you recognize this verse. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified by grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. It's talking about the free gift of salvation that we can only get through faith. Um, it says, This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he may be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So he's just simply saying, We're all sinners. We all need a rescue. We all need a savior. And we can be justified um, just as I never sinned. We can be justified, um, made right with God, not because of us doing good stuff, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. It made a way for us to be righteous, to have our sins forgiven because of what Jesus did, not because of our religion or our good works. Nothing we could ever do could earn us our salvation. Nothing we could ever do could make it where we deserve it. We are given and offered this gift of salvation, the gift of a relationship with God, our sins forgiven, and it's not because of us. It's because of what Jesus did on the cross for us in our place. The next section is all are equal. And as I thought about that, I think I also could have put all can be made right with God through faith. Um, so do we just throw out the good works? Do we just throw out the serving? Do we throw out the loving other people? Since it doesn't like, help us with our salvation, do we just throw all that stuff out? He's going to address this here in verse 31. It says, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So guys, what he's saying is we don't throw out the doing. Okay? We don't throw out those good things. 
those, those works are good things, but we must surrender to God first. Once we have surrendered our life uh, to Christ, then we follow Him by grace. We're, we're just living a life, man, we're so thankful that for what Jesus did that it makes us want to serve. It makes us want to love people. It's very organic. It's very um, easy for us to do that. We're not doing it to earn God's favor and His love like He already gave that to us. It's not about trying harder. It's about surrendering to God. You guys, um, that kind of concludes our, our two chapters there. But after I, I finished that this week and as I, I sat in my office, I really believe that God had two more verses that He wanted me to share with you. And, um, and when God puts something on my heart to do, I take that really serious. So I, I have two more verses that I want to share with you guys today. The first one is 1 Peter 3.9. I want to read it to you. It says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Isn't that good news that God is patient with us? Man, I'm really thankful for that. God, and, and what this verse is saying, that God desires that everyone respond to the good news of the gospel. That's God's desire. Now, me and you probably both know that not everybody's going to respond to the gospel. Not everybody's going to give their life to Christ. You probably know people that haven't, or maybe, maybe it's you. Maybe you have not surrendered your life to Christ. Many times, I think what happens is that people will begin attending church and get excited and begin immediately doing, right? Serving, loving, all these good things. But, but all of us, no matter what our background is, um, all of us must surrender to God first before we try to do anything with God and for God. We have to surrender our lives to Him, accept this free gift of salvation, and you know, believing that Jesus died on the cross, believing that the Bible is true, having our sins forgiven, and God gives us a clean slate, a fresh, a fresh new start. But we have to surrender our lives to Him in faith that all that is true. So I want to ask you a question this morning. I really want you to think about this. If somebody asked you, hey, what's your, your story of faith? Why are you a person that you know, goes to church or follows Jesus with your life? Like, what's your story? I, I, would, I would really think about this. Would your story be, well, one time somebody invited me to church and I went there and I kept going and it was good. And I started serving there. I started, you know, really making a difference in the community. Guys, that's all doing. <laughs> Attendance of church, serving, loving, all those things are good. But that's all doing. Or would your story of faith sound more like this? Man, I heard the gospel. I heard this, that Jesus loved me so much he died on the cross for my sin. And so I gave my life to Jesus. And it changed everything. My desires changed. And man, all of a sudden I wanted to start serving God. I wanted to start loving people. I wanted to start reading God's word. What would you say if someone asked you your story of faith? Would your story be about surrender? Or would your story be about doing? This other verse, or it's really three verses that I want to share with you, is honestly the scariest verse in the Bible to me. And, and it's a verse that absolutely breaks my heart. Because I know it's true. So I want you to follow with me on this one. It's in Matthew, and it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, and this is just hard to even read, I never knew you. Like, I, I, I don't know you. It says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Guys, 
there will be many people, and you may be sitting by someone, that attend our church regularly, come here, love it, they're all in, but they don't know God. They've never surrendered their life to Him. And you know what? They're going to end up in hell forever. A place that was meant for Satan and his demons. They're going to come before God and be like, no, 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 you don't understand. You're getting this wrong. I went to church. Do you not understand, God? Or, man, you know, I, I, I gave money in the thing when it came by in the bucket. and Or, man, I really tried to make a difference in the community and, and really care for people. And God's going to go, okay, but I, I don't know you. And guys, it's not about, hey, when I was this many years old, I prayed a prayer, but I actually never followed Jesus with my life. I mean, it's good. A prayer is a great way to start a relationship with God. Um, and, and it's saying that you commit your life to Him, but uh, you have to, what does that verse say? Um, Into the kingdom of God. But the one who does the will of my Father. That means it's not about just praying a prayer. It's about living a life of following Jesus. So have you ever done that? Have you ever surrendered your life to Jesus? I'm not asking if you've ever been to church. I'm not asking you if you believe in God. Satan believes in God too. What I'm saying is, have you actually surrendered your life to God? And then are you, with your life, following the ways of Jesus? Doing the will of the Father? Like, if you looked at your life would you be able to say, I'm doing everything I can to know what God wants me to do and to follow him? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Like, do you know for sure? This is something that you need to know. D.L. Moody says, let God have your life. He can do more with it than you can. That is talking about surrender. Have you surrendered your life to God? Like, do you know for sure? If you don't, it is worth having a conversation with someone. I'd, I'd love to have that conversation with you. Guys, it's not about our doing. That has to come after our surrender. And our heart has to be right. Would you guys close your eyes? We're going to enter into a time of response. Man, every week we want to take a second and say, Okay, God, I hear what you're saying. What does that mean for me? And so I don't know what God spoke to you about this morning, but I want to encourage you to talk to Him. Maybe there's some sin in your life you need to confess in these moments just to be in right fellowship with God. Or maybe you're at a place where you're like, no, I, I actually need to surrender my life to Jesus right now. I need to do it. I, I don't, I've never done that. I believe in God. I believe in the Bible, but I've never really surrendered my life to Jesus. In these moments, you can just tell God, I, I believe in you. I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe that the Bible is true. And, and I, I see my need for a rescue. Like, on my own, I'm sinful, and I need forgiveness of my sins. And in these moments, you can talk to the God of the universe. He's your creator. He loves you more than anything, and he just wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to forgive you of your sin. So right where you're sitting, you can do business with God. Or if you'd like to talk with a, a pastor, we're always available in the back of the room. We would love to talk with you about that or pray with you. God, I thank you so much for your word. It's just so clear. It's, it's heavy. It's heavy. These, this scripture is a lot. God, we're so grateful that you offer us grace. You offer us forgiveness and a good life. You offer us a life of following you. God, we just want to spend these next few moments talking to you, singing to you, and just really processing what you're saying to us right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.